Welcome back to Discipleship Training. We are still continuing our series talking about the framework of discipleship. Uh, so we've been talking about godly intimacy over the past few weeks. And what we started with last week is talking about honesty with yourself and God and, and how trust and vulnerability are necessary in order for you to be honest with the person in your relationship. And so what we've been talking about is not deceiving ourselves in our relationship with the Lord. And we looked at a number of scriptures and we're going to pick up from here where it's talking about not deceiving ourselves in the sense of our behavior, our thought processes, how we see ourselves, not thinking more of ourselves than we actually are, but being honest and not living in a state of denial so the Lord can be effective through this relationship to continue to build us up as disciples and as we disciple others, helping them to understand that being, that growing and maturing in the Lord to perfection is a process, right? So being flawed, having weaknesses, having misunderstandings, things that you need to learn, all of that is a part of the process. And helping those we are discipling to come to grips with that, that you will not be perfect from day one, that you will make mistakes. And the, the goal is for you to be honest with yourself and the Lord for him to help alleviate those situations and build you up. Um, and so we're going to continue in that vein today, picking up with First Corinthians, in, picking up in the New King James Version. We're going to read First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Oh, let me share screen. Sorry. Hold on just a second. No, it's not right there. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. First Corinthians, what? Chapter 15, verse, first, uh, verse 33 in the New King James Version. So that is the New King James Version, and we are reading First Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So, what we see here, right, as we're talking about not deceiving ourselves, one of the biggest issues that a lot of new saints have as they begin the process of discipleship is who they used to hang around. Right? Because we live in a society which, you know, Everybody is like, the moment you have a change in your life, it is that critique of, oh, you acting brand new. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's it it is a shaming tactic. Mm -hmm. Because the people who you used to hang around with, and this can be, this doesn't have to be related to spirituality, right? Like, that is the context in which we're talking about. But we can frame it in anything, right? You get a new job. You get a promotion. You finish your degree. Shoot, you decide to stop drinking and smoking. It, whatever, especially in a positive way when you are trying to change an aspect of your life the people who you used to hang out with or in some cases still hang out with but are in st still in that stage of their development or that stage of their life cycle they try to shame you for making the decision that I want better mm -hmm. whatever it is right an extreme example that I actually found very funny um, I think it happened like two years ago but Lizzo the singer, right? She is huge about body positivity and anti-body shaming, whatever. But two years ago, she actually made the public announcement that she was going to start exercising and dieting and like wanting to improve her overall health. And she was shamed for it. And what was even funnier and ironic about it, she was shamed for the people who lifted her up. Because she decided, she wasn't saying, you know, there's a problem with being fat. She wasn't saying that you all should follow this path too. She made a decision that she said, for my health, I want to improve. I want to make some changes. And it was, oh, you got a little money now, so you, you want to act brand new. You was fine with being a big girl when you was just starting out, but now it's not the popular thing, whatever. And I just, I always find that so funny because the people who will say that they're body positive, when you make a decision to say like, I don't want to live like that anymore, 
they quickly become body shame. But this is what we see a lot in society in general, and specifically when we talk about a newly converted saint. It immediately, that shaming tactic of, hey, like, I can't hang out with y'all the way I used to, or like, no, I'm not trying to go there because I'm trying to live a godly lifestyle, or I'm not trying to fall into temptation. Oh, you think you're better than us now? Are you acting brand new? I remember when you used to do this worse than we did, but you got a little God in your life, right? It is the shaming tactic. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to help disciples, those we are discipling understand, is one that is a tactic of the enemy. Identify it quickly, right? Secondly, don't let it deceive you. You can't be the light in a dark room in which you used to participate. Right? Because that's what a lot of people's mindset is. I am going to go, you know, I've come into salvation. I've been born again. I'm trying to live this lifestyle. I'm about to go into the same rooms in which I used to do the same things with those people and be like, y'all need to come out. It's not going to happen. Exactly. Because when they see you, they are not going to see you now as a light. They're going to see you as, oh, now you think you're better than us. You used to be in this room with us. It's not to say that that may never happen. Right? Because there are a lot of people who have been that light to family members and friends when they've matured and they now can handle those more difficult conversations. When there's time has passed from that initial hurting of, I, I got to cut you off because I'm trying to live differently. Right? So helping them to understand, like, don't deceive yourself. If you're hanging around with people that are not living the lifestyle that you live, you are not strong. <laughs> And that is what scripture is trying to convey. You cannot hang around with fleet, with dogs with fleas and think you're going to come up clean. That's just not how it works. And there is this misconception in the body of Christ where that's what people say. Well, how am I supposed to draw the loss if I never hang out with them? That's not what scripture is talking about in drawing the loss. You go and reach them through the gospel, not by being a friend. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a difference. And it's not to say that through association or companionship at work or conversations that you cannot begin to draw them. But what I cannot become is where we have an intimate relationship as friends. Because you are going to draw me. I am not going to draw you. And scripture is very clear from the Old Testament to the New about that specific example. The children of Israel were told explicitly, separate from them. Do not hang out with them. Do not welcome their cultures. Do not mingle with them. Do not marry your sons and daughters to them. Be ye separate. Because evil company corrupts good habits. In the King James Version, I believe it says good behavior. So what it is talking about, hanging out with evil people is going to corrupt your lifestyle. Whether you want to admit it or not. So this is part of being honest with the Lord. And as we begin to disciple people... Saying, I know those are your friends. I know y'all been through a lot, right? I know that's your family. Shoot, I know that's your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your fiance. Be you separate. And this is part of the cost of when you make this decision, have you factored this in? Have you weighed that this means some people in your life have to be cut off because they're not good for you? Thoughts, questions, and comments there. Went down on my bike. Alright. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Same version. New King James Version. Yep. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. Right? And then there's additional scripture that says if you sow into the spirit, you will reap of the spirit. If you sow into corruption or your flesh, you will reap of corruption. So what is what is God trying to communicate to us? And this is what this is what so was so interesting to me. Is you never know like how many versions of a statement are in scripture until you study it. And there are like so many scriptures that literally start with do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Why is that important? Because the Lord is saying that this is self-deception. 
You're telling yourself this. You're buying into this worldview, this thought process. And so here, what God is communicating is be careful what you do. Your actions are planting a seed. That's what this is talking about. So even though you may have the best intentions, you sowing into corruption or doing a little bad for the greater good, because we see that a lot too. God is not mocked. He's not going to be like, you know what? The end justifies the means. That is not how God operates. Righteousness from the beginning, righteousness to the end. So we have to reiterate when a, when a saint is now going through the process of discipleship, the way the world teaches us to operate, right? A little white lie won't hurt. The end justifies the means. The greater good is worth the little bad. Like all of these, like all of these sayings that we have to justify evil, to justify corruption, does not fly with the Lord. So do not deceive yourself that, you know, I'm just telling this little white lie for the greater good. No, that is not how the Lord operates. The greater good is you staying true to his word. If telling the truth means that you lose something, then so be it. If telling the truth means someone else loses something, then so be it. If getting to the just end in God's eyes is more difficult, then so be it. You can't find shortcuts. So we have to be very clear when we're, when we're bringing up saints. Is, and this is where we talk about conversion, right? Their mind has to be renewed. The same things that you used to do, the same shortcuts that you used to take, the lies that you told to get your way, to move it, to make the path, to take the path the least resistant, you are sowing into corruption. And what you think the end is going to justify, the benefit, the gain you think you're going to receive, you are going to receive the fruit of that seed that was planted in corruption. So you... All of this is to say with being honest with yourself is not telling yourself these lies that society allows itself to tell. Be honest with yourself. You telling the truth is going to adversely affect you. Be honest about it. And accept that faith, whatever it is. Right? You being honest about your faith. I might not go as far as I want to in life. So be it. Because the reward is greater than you trying to lie or diminish. Because what scripture tells us is you're denying God. And what he is going to do is he's going, you're denying Jesus and he will deny you. <laughs> so we have to be very clear that when a saint has been converted and is going through the process of discipleship, one of the biggest enemies to that is themselves and the lies we tell ourselves because we do not want to face the truth because we don't want to deal with the truth because we don't want to admit that we're not as good as we think we are we're not as smart as we think we are we're not as strong as we think we are we're not as good as we think we are like looking at yourself and this is something I had to come to grips with when I really started to get serious about my walk is looking at the mirror for your flaws and your blemishes is extremely difficult Coming face to face with the fact that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is is difficult. Because the way we are brought up is not to be a bad person. And what being a bad person means, crime. Right? I'm not out here killing, stealing, raping, lying to a bunch of people, hurting people. Right? I'm a productive member of society. I go to work. I'm on my business. I try to treat people the same way they treat me, etc. But when we come into relationship with the Lord, we start seeing the true ugliness of our character. That while we may have not killed anyone, hurt anyone, robbed anyone, we're slanderers, liars, gossipers. We don't love our neighbors. We have bias that affects our decision making. Right? We show partisanship based on whatever tribe or race or ethnic group we belong in. All of these things where we're just like, well, that's just natural. And the Lord is saying, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying too. It's carnal. (laughs) And we have to come to face with that. So we have to prepare those who we are discipling 
is when confronted with that image, accept it, and that it is a, it's okay, and don't deceive yourself in it. All right. So now, so after we've had this conversation of not deceiving ourselves, it comes to the point of telling the Lord what's going on before it overtakes you. And in my experiencing, my experience with counseling people. People try to carry the weight of the world until it gets too heavy. Then they go to the Lord. But by that point, not in all cases, right? But in most cases, you're now at a point of desperation. You may have already fallen into sin. You may have already done something stupid. Where in being honest with God, come to him knowing that he cares about us knowing that he wants our burdens knowing that he has a relationship with us before it gets to the point of desperation before it overtakes you before all of a sudden now you find yourself in a place of sin when the Lord was like I could have helped you before you crossed this threshold and that's one of the things like my dad always tried to pour into me when I was growing up he would always say that what he would say is Donovan come to me when the shovel hits the dirt not once you hit the bottom because what I would do is I would get into a situation and the shovel would hit the dirt and he's right there is when you need to come to me but I keep digging <laughs> I can figure it out I can get around it I can do it and then you hit bedrock you can't go no deeper <laughs> and you look up and you're 100, foot, 100 feet in the ground, and now somebody come help me. Somebody come rescue me. And now God, what I don't want to paint the picture is that God is incapable of pulling you out of that hole, because that is not the truth. He is. He is more than able. He is more than willing. The problem is trauma comes with that hole. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, all of these other things that are going to be so much more difficult to deal with had we just addressed the situation before you started digging. Yeah. Trina, did you have something to say? Or are you hit by mistake? Okay, that may have been by mistake. Okay. So let's start looking at it in scripture. So let's stay in the New King James Version. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, 7 and 10. 7 through 10. So in the New King James Version, let's go to 1 Peter Chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. (laughs) Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be uh, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So going back to the... Uh, Trina, before you dropped off, did you have something to say or that was a mistake when you raised your hand? Uh, no, I was saying I agree with Donovan, and God had to teach me that I was still dealing with a lot of pride because I would wait till I just couldn't figure it out, and then I'm like, okay, God, help me with the answer instead of going to Him beforehand. And it was just a lot of hard lessons in learning that being His child to mm. deal with that spirit of pride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's real good. Yeah, and we're going to talk about humility, but you're absolutely right. It comes from a sense of pride of we as human beings struggle with being helpless mm-hmm. and, and coming to grips with the fact that there are just some things we can't do. There are some things we just we can't handle. And the point of, and I think this, honestly, I think this increases in difficulty as folks get grown. Because, right, God is our father. So it's like, you know, I'm 30. I should be able to handle this. I should be able to deal with this. And it's the same way you would with your natural parents. Like, I'm not trying to go to them and ask for help with my rent money. I'm grown. But that sense of pride is what gets you buried. Mm -hmm. And now, to what I said earlier, there's much more weight than just the initial issue. 
there's everything that has came with it. So before, you may have just been late on your rent. But now because you decided to address it yourself, you took out a payday loan with a 20% interest, <laughs> now you $10,000 in the hole. Right? You get what I'm saying? That's what people don't consider. When you try to resolve the issues yourself without God, it doesn't, it comes with weight. Yeah. And what the Lord is communicating is it'll be easier for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Because this isn't not this not this is not about the difficulty for the Lord. Right? Everything is simple to the Lord. It becomes difficult because he has to work through humans. <laughs> That, that's the difference. If it was just up to the Lord, it's not a problem. But I have to work through you imperfect, you weak, you prideful, you arrogant, you simple human beings. And that complicates the issue. Right? So when you were in this abusive relationship, when you saw the red flags, you should have left. And prayed for me the strength to do it. But you waited five years. So now I got to deal with the abuse. With the heartache, with the emotional trauma, with the baggage. And now your new relationship, you're struggling. So I got to deal with that too. All of this weight that comes with you deciding, Lord, I'm not going to give it to you. And so what we see here in scripture, and this is what we see here in 1 Peter chapter 5, right? Starting at verse 7, just to recap, right? Bring every burden to the Lord because he cares for you. Um, Go back up to verse 8 for me real quick. But this is... This is what I thought was very interesting, is that we we see this conversation then paired with us being vigilant and sober, meaning being watchful, being aware, right? Not being distracted. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, he's looking around like a lion. What do lions do? What do predators do? They seek the weak. Who's overburdened? Who got too much weight on their plate? Exactly, right? (laughs) Who's, who, who can I isolate from the pack? Yeah. Because they're, they got shame now because they're doing stuff they ain't got no business doing and they won't tell nobody. They won't confess to their brothers and sisters that they need help. Yeah. They're trying to hide it. Who can I whisper in their ear that they'll never be enough, that they're inadequate? This is why God is saying, give me the weight. Because what you do is you make yourself susceptible, vulnerable to be cut off from the pack, to be isolated. And I have seen that in so many times when people fall into sin. The first thing Satan gets them to do is they isolate themselves. And why they think in their mind, and this is the deception, you know, I'm just going away to get myself together. Satan is rubbing his paws. This is exactly what I want. Because you're already in a weakened state. Yeah. And he knows what scripture says. With man, it's not possible. (laughs) So you're going and isolating yourself, thinking that you about to win this battle by yourself? Right. No, this is why scripture tells us not to forsake the fellowship of the brotherhood. This is one of the reasons. You are stronger in a pack. Yeah. But the moment Satan can get you cut off, get you self-doubting, get you sitting in your pity party, he, pity party, he has you. Just like a predator. I got you exactly where I want you. So what the Lord is saying, before that happens... Come to me. Before you dig a hole, come to me. Don't think you need to try to fix it. And that is something that so many disciples struggle with. Is we think that we're stronger than the Lord. That we're more capable. That we have more insight, foresight, understanding, knowledge. That I can solve this problem without him. I'm going to save him for the big stuff. But the big stuff... It's like snow, a snowball rolling down the hill. It might start small. <laughs> but the little stuff turns to big stuff. But there was, there was a huge path in between where the Lord was like, I could have got involved at any moment had you just been honest with me. But now we got to deal with all of this other stuff that really did not come into place until you decided, I'm going to take this burden on myself. Thoughts, questions there. Makes sense. I feel like some people just, I mean, I agree with you 100%, but also people are not taught on how to, like, like new believers, uh, yeah, new believers, like, they're not taught how to make sacrifices or 
lead from the path they started from, if that makes sense. Like, they just, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, you've been converted, you're, you, you're not born again, then they just throw them out there. But they're lost because they, that's what they all they know. It's like, I've been born again, but they can't explain exactly what been, what happened to them or how to pray or how to um, be vigilant or sober, like, when it comes to this stuff. Like, and then it just repeats. It's just a cycle just going over and over again. And then they feel like they have a rut. I, I was just talking to somebody, and he was saying, like, I just, I, I, I've been water baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and nothing happened. Like, because they, they look for something visual. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you, and I was just asking, like, you saw in the spiritual realm what happened? He was like, well, no. But I'm like, so how do you know something didn't happen? Like, and that's where they, been taught, they've been taught to look for something more physical and visual, like that they actually see and touch. And I'm like, that, it don't work like this. You are still a work in progress. Like, you still have to be built up and uh, talk these things on how to, how to uh, fight these battles. And that's why I feel like that's the problem right there. Because it's like, once they become born again, it's like, that's it. That's all they've been taught. Yeah. There's a gap in their education. Yeah. Right? Um, and it's just like with anything, it's. A lot, unfortunately, a lot of churches, the way they approach getting people born again is on the job training, but in the wrong context, right? So there should be on the job training with discipleship, but that's about you operating in discipleship. When it comes to your training on how to be a disciple, what does this born again lifestyle look like? Why is it important? What are the tools I need? That should be a very specific, unique, and intimate experience. And so many churches leave people in those gaps of struggling to figure out the next step. Like, oh, okay. They were really hands-on to get you down in that water. They were really hands-on to get you filled with the Holy Spirit. But now, all of a sudden, everybody gone. Like, it didn't happen. Now you can't find nobody. Now, the number's not getting, you know, nobody's calling your phone no more. You're not getting checked up on like you were before. And, and, and that gap is where so many babes in Christ find themselves. Um, all right, so. I do have another question. Yep. Uh, let me see. Resist and stay fast in faith, knowing the same suffering is experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What do you mean by your brotherhood in the world? He's talking about the body worldwide. Okay. Like, so what you are going through. Now, contextually, what he was talking about is people was getting killed. <laughs> but <laughs> as we can apply to our life today, which. Did we talk about it in this session? No, we didn't. I think we were talking about it during Gather Talks. We were talking about temptation and how. There is nothing that is unique, right? Like, there's nothing that no one has never experienced that you are alone. And this goes back to being honest with the Lord. And this is what Peter is trying to help this body of believers understand. Is that what you are going through right now is not unique and independent to you. And take comfort. And the fact that the fight you're fighting, you're not fighting alone because every other brother, every other member of the body of Christ is going through the same thing. And some have overcame it. And it comes to the point where, like I said, being honest with the Lord before a situation overtakes you is being honest that this is, you're not by yourself. Like what you think is like no one else would understand, no one else is going through, that is a trick of the enemy. That's what, exactly what he wants you to believe. Because if you think that you're going through something that is unique, that is specific, that no one will understand, that no one will have grace towards you, that no one would, everybody is going to look at you and disgust and shame you, what are you going to do? Well, I ain't telling nobody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it to myself. Ain't nobody going to understand anyway. And one of the things, like, one of the biggest misconceptions and just straight out lies that have came from the enemy camp that has been grafted into society so well is this concept of the Lord helps those who help them help themselves it is, it, like, it's a very common southern statement that God that if you want God's help you got to prove you can do it on your own God helps those who help themselves and that is completely contrary to scripture because if we could help ourselves why would I need God <laughs> exactly it's stupid if anything I'm going to be annoyed 
Like, oh, I didn't got the the boulder up the hill, and I'm at the crest, and now you show up. Ah, oh, let's get this thing downhill. <laughs> I don't need you. <laughs> I've done the hard part. And but it, all it is is a trick of the enemy, because he wants you to try to do that, right? Because what we know, and what Tremiko is teaching on Mondays. Is that we are in a spiritual battle. But we physically cannot compete with the power of Satan. Meaning in our own power, in our own will, it is not a fair fight. The only thing that makes that fair, the only thing that honestly puts it in our favor, is the power of the Holy Spirit. So the benefit to Satan is, I need to get y'all separated. I need to get you operating in your own will. I need to get you operating in your flesh. I need you to get in your head thinking that you can do it, that you don't need nobody, that you're going to get over this by yourself. Because now I have removed you from your greatest advantage. And so this is why, like, this has to be taught. This has to be brought up. This has to be instilled. Because our human nature, especially as Americans, because that is, our culture is to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Not to be a drain, not to ask anyone for help, to figure it out. That is our culture. That is how we all have been raised. Figure it out. Get it done. Nobody cares about you. What are you going to do? But it is that worldview that is contrary to our relationship with the Lord. Where we see in scripture, we are told to lean on God. Not to, not to attempt anything without him. But when, you, when you've been brought up, and everything around you has sold you that you are to be independent. Becoming dependent is extremely difficult. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the Amplified Classic. And we're going to read Proverbs 18 and 1. So in the Amplified Classic, let's read Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. He who willfully separates and estranges himself from God and man seeks his own desire and pretext to break out against all wise and sound judgment. So a person who has found themselves in sin, found themselves in, in, in struggle and in, in fault, whatever, and decides I'm going to separate myself you, you have made the decision that I am seeking my own desire, my carnal flesh, and looking for a reason. That's what pretext is. I am looking for a reason to break out against all wise and sound judgment, which we know is based in the word of God. So think of a person you know who fell into sin or who got hurt, had their feelings hurt in church. And they said, you know what? I'm going to separate myself because I just need time and space. What scripture is telling us is you're an idiot. <laughs> and, and be honest about what this is about. This is not about who hurt you. It's about you seeking your own desire. And it don't even have to be somebody hurt. It could just be... I just want to wild out. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the pretext. Church. I just want to wild out. Huh? So church be too greedy. Yeah, any, any reason a person says, this is why I don't go to church no more? Yeah. What scripture is saying, that this is not about the church. <laughs> about you. It's about you seeking your own desire and your flesh looking for a reason. This is why I don't follow God. Go ahead. So my cousin had reached out to me the other week. Um, and he's like not a Christian um, at all. And he has told me that, like, from when he was way younger, he pretty much decided to just follow his own judgment because he, I don't know, like, what his experience was, but I'm assuming it was church hurt. And, um, and then I was just like, well, you follow me right now because you're confused. You are trying to figure out the point of life and the purpose, and, and you're not, like, fulfilled and everything. I'm like, how has your own judgment been working for you so far? And Great like, question. And he was like, he was, he was honestly really receptive of everything that I was saying. I told him the gospel. I told him about like our, well, my, my life and how I ended up coming into Christ and like what the Lord has done in me and Andrew's life and just different ways he's provided and stuff like that. And sent him a bunch of gather videos too. 
And I was I was like, give him the information. I'm like, at the end of the day, if you choose not to believe, that's on you, but you got the information. And he ended up texting me a few days later, and he was like, I really like the guy that talks, I like the way they speak. Um, and I was like, yeah, because they just have a normal conversation. It's not over-exaggerated or anything like that. But anyways, the point of this was that he was uh, <laughs> he had, he had was making his own, like, he just decided, he was like, I'm just going to go based on my own logic. And I was like, well, your own logic is not working so hard for you, which is why you're confused right now. And yeah, he was really something when I was happy. Yeah. And I was just like, I would just do the work and take your life. So this is why this, this, is why this scripture is important, right? Because what... What the Lord wants to establish, like we have an honest relationship. And in, in an honest relationship, there's communication. So what the Lord is saying from his perspective is, don't make this about me. This is about you. <laughs> right? Don't deceive yourself and then be like, this is why I don't go to church no more. This is why I don't, da, da, da. You just want to do your own thing. Yeah. You just be honest about right, it. Just say it. <laughs> just say it. You just want to do your own thing, and you were looking for pretext, a reason, an excuse, so you could deceive yourself and being like, it's not me, it's you. And what the Lord is saying is, just like with any relationship, when you find yourself entertaining those thoughts, have a conversation with me. Because I will reveal to you exactly, this is not about what they said. It's not about what they told you that you should wear. This is not about whatever excuse you didn't put in your head. This is about your flesh and your own desires. When I saw this scripture, I was like, Lord, I always felt this way, but I didn't have a scripture to back it up. <laughs> but it is so, it is the truth that when people say, like, I am leaving for X, what God is saying, no, you are leaving for you. And just be honest about it. And so as we are building up disciples, this is a conversation we can say, we can have. Hey, there are going to be some stuff that annoy you. Right. There are going to be some stuff that get on your nerves. There are going to be some folks that say that they're Christian and, you, and they're going to call you everything but a child of God. They're going to be mean to you. Right? All of, all of these things. But here's the truth. It has nothing to do with the Lord. And the moment you try to make it about him is the moment you're going to try to find yourself leaving. And I don't think enough Christian and spiritual leaders have that real honest conversation that a lot of the folks that are in this church don't reflect the spirit of the Lord. And, it, and that is a re, it is an unfortunate reality, but it is a reality. Because what they do is they sell a bill of false goods. That, oh, you're going to be welcome into this community and everybody's going to love on you. No, you're not. <laughs> They're going to be a small group of people that actually are trying to reflect the character of God who are going to rally around you, who are going to support you, who are going to build you up. But the vast majority of everybody else are the same people that you saw in the world. They're vain, they're mean, they're rude. They have, don't have a kind bone in their body, a kind word to say to anyone. They're, they are prone to partiality. They have cliques. They're not going to welcome you into that clique. Just be honest. And this is what we have to do as disciples and those who are discipling. We have to prepare them for the world that is, not the world that we wish it to be. Yeah. And I, I wish that everybody was like that. That we all reflected God's character, that we were welcoming, that we were kind, that we showed love to people who look different than us, who came from different backgrounds, who aren't church people, that they street folks that didn't got born again, right? That they weren't born, they're not pew babies, that they don't get church culture. I wish that was the case, yeah. but it's not. And so we have to prepare disciples for the reality of the world. Yeah. So when they find themselves in this situation, in this exact situation, that you know what, y'all ain't, y'all ain't no different than the world. I'm about to separate myself. You are serving to your own destruction. Right. Any thoughts, questions, comments on that before we go to the the next verse? Yeah, that makes sense. Good scripture. I have to write that down. Actually, Judas Proverbs 18 amplified. And just so, just so we were clear, willfully means that they made the decision yeah. to separate and estrange themselves. Like, nobody drug them out. Nobody kicked them out. Like, they said, I'm leaving. That's what the scripture is talking about. They made the willful decision to separate from fellowship. 
All right, so let's now go back to the New King James Version. And we're going to read verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So in the New King James Version, let's read 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And so this is going to lead in to our next point. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin is a separator from the Lord. It separates us from him because it pulls us out of right standing, which is righteousness. But what Jesus is communicating is just because sin has separated you, does that mean you have to stay separated? There is a prescribed way for you to get back in right standing, and that is confession. And I can speak from my own experience. Oftentimes, it took me too long to confess and, and, and repent. Because of the shame, because of, in some cases, I just wanted to do it and in, in, in whatever. But I got to this point where it's spiritually, I was like, this is enough. But physically, because of the shame, because of the self-hate and the doubt, and how could I come to him in this state? I wouldn't. And so many people who find themselves in sin, that's exactly what happens. They get paralyzed. And so what the Lord is saying is, is confess. I have given you a process to fix it every single time, right? Think about how often we wish when we made a mistake we had an instant do-over. That it was just a process that we could just be like, let me just hit the reset button and this, let's just start over, right? How many times have we botched the first impression and we just like, dang, I, I wish I could do that over. What the Lord is saying here is I've given you a process. We, we can't act like it didn't happen but we can reset we were not in right standing you can get back in right standing right? you messed up, you offended me apologize <laughs> and we're good confess and I'm, I, will, I will cleanse you that's all you gotta do is confess I will help, repent with a sincere heart I will help you turn away I will help you walk this repentance thing out all you got to do is say something. And that's where the Lord is coming from. Is before it gets too late. Confess. Before there's no more time on the clock. Before it can't be fixed. Before you get too entrenched. Because that's what happens to a lot of people too. Some folks get out here thinking they're just going to be out there for a little bit. And they out there for a while. <laughs> Confess. Get it right. Start over. The Lord wants us when it comes to our relationship is to trust him enough that he is capable enough to deal with what we're going through to deal with what we're being attacked with deal with what we're struggling with that it is not beyond his care right that when we came into relationship with him Maybe we didn't come in with full knowledge as to what this relationship would entail, but he did. <laughs> there is nothing that he didn't know. There is nothing that was a shock. There is nothing that is going to surprise him. There is nothing that is going to catch him off guard. He knew ahead of time. So just confess. And I wish, I honestly, when I was going through my struggle, I wish someone would have just said, Donovan, you, you're not too far gone. There's a process to hit reset. Don't let the shame and the self-hate keep you entrenched into something that spiritually you hear the voice of the Lord calling you home. Just come home. And this reminds me of the prodigal son. Just come home. And there were so many, think about it, the prodigal son did not go home until he hit rock bottom. Like my dad said. The moment his money was gone, he should have been like, yeah, I'm not as smart as I thought I was. The moment he was living less than some of the ser than the servants in his father's home, I need to go ahead, just go home. Swallow that pride. Go home. And this is what the Lord is saying to us. And it leads into our next point of confession of sin. Just open your mouth. That there is a there is a path 
that the Lord has specifically outlined for us that is not hidden, that is not complicated, that doesn't come with, oh, I'm going to bring this up later, though, when we get in the argument. Right. <laughs> Confess. In the moment you do, I am just to forgive, and I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So we're going to stay in the New King James Version. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 15. And I like how Tremico says it, that when we find ourselves committed to sin, confess the moment it's done. Like, don't wait. Don't, like, when, you, when you've identified it, when you know, oh, I'm, shoot, I just lied, confess. Ask for forgiveness. Because you don't want those things to build up and become anchors. Where to all of a sudden, what was a one-time thing, has now become a lifestyle thing and you're entrenched in iniquity. And once again, like I always say, and what I've been saying, the Lord is more capable, more powerful, but we are not. Yeah. And getting entrenched in iniquity is not an easy thing to just one day be like, okay, I'm done with living this lifestyle. Yeah. That's not how iniquity works. Exactly. <laughs> and often, and we've seen this in scripture, if you live in iniquity long enough, you flirt with a, re- a reprobate mind. Mm-hmm. Because eventually the Lord is going to be like, you want to be out there so bad, I'm going to leave you out there. Yep. Because you've made the decision. Not because he's all of a sudden writing us off. No, you have made it clear that this is what you want to do. I'm removing the bumpers. <laughs> have that. It. Enjoy the life you have chosen. And it hurts my heart. But when I see people, and scripture talks about this, those who have experienced the grace, the power of God, have been born again, have seen signs, miracles, and wonders. Like, they know this to be true. And they go back out there. And they make the decision that I'm going to leave what I have confirmed with my eyes, my ears, the things that I felt, the things that I've heard and seen, I have confirmed him to be true, him to be real in my own life, not based on what someone else told me, but in my own life. But I'm going to go back out there. You're setting yourself up to be stuck out there. So, in the New King James Version, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 15, woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us, and who knows us? This is a warning. That judgment will come for you. That is the woe. Woe to those who seek deep, meaning you are trying maliciously to hide your ungodly and evil counsel, your actions, your works, your deeds. And This warning comes to those who are we are discipling. Don't think that you can outsmart God. (laughs) There is nothing that you can think, nothing that you can say, nothing that you can do to hide from him. So just confess. (laughs) Just be like, you know what, Lord? My bad. I did. And let's move on. And I find this a lot of times like And we talked about this a few weeks ago, but like in relationships and friendships is because of a lack of communication, people get into their own heads about what the situation is going to be. And they they start this like just feedback loop of talking to themselves of, well, they probably think this or I should think this or I should do this. Just go talk to them. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when we're talking about being honest, when you're about to sin, just be honest that you're about to sin. You can't hide it from it. Yeah. Right? There is nothing that you there is nothing that you're gonna do that the Lord will be like, oh, I missed that one. Donovan really got one over me. Which is amazing <laughs> that people think that they can hide stuff from A hundred percent. Just be real. And I honestly now this is gonna sound bad, but I'm just I'm completely transparent. But there were times where when I was living a lukewarm lifestyle that I would just be like Lord, I'm about to just, just, just go do this thing. Like, I'm not even, like, I'm not about to play games with you. Yeah, because you know. So. <laughs> you already know. Yeah. You already know that I'm not going to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know this conviction is not about to work. Let's just be real. I'm about to go sin. And what is the Lord going to do? 
You're a free will creature. I'm not going to force you not to do it. I've already tried to convict you. You already know my word. It's not, it doesn't mean I can go do it and just come back to him. like it, it, The process. Confess. But if we were really honest about our relationship with the Lord, that honesty would lead us to actually being like, why is it that I want to do this? What's the root of this? Right? You would start having more intimate conversations with the Lord to actually resolve the issue instead of thinking that I'm going to hide it from him. Somehow he's not going to figure this thing out. <laughs> Somehow I'm going to be the one in all of eternity, they got a fast one past God. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. And so Isaiah is warning to those. Woe to those. Meaning to beware. That if in your mindset, you're setting out to do evil. And you think you're going to hide. You think you're going to cover it up. That you think this dark won't come to light. You deceive yourselves. Alright. So staying in the New King James Version. Let's go to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. So staying in the New King James Version, we're going to go to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So when we're talking about honesty and being honest with God in this confession of sin, don't be like, the Lord allowed me to do this, or Satan made me do this. Just be honest. And it is so much easier for the Lord to deal with the situation when you just are honest with him. Lord, there is this desire in me and I'm tempted by it. Okay, now we can deal with it. Right? It's easier to deal with the beast in the room when everybody points and says, that's the beast. But the moment you live in denial, the moment that you're telling yourself that, you know, if, if this is the reason and if I wasn't hanging out with them, I wouldn't be doing this. Or if I wasn't in a relationship with this person, I wouldn't be doing this. You're lying to yourself. And what I talked about, you're, you're entrenching yourself. Because that's what self-deception does. It allows you to get comfortable with sin. But as we talked about a few weeks ago, our mind doesn't do good with puzzles. <laughs> Right? That cognitive dissonance. It's not adding up. The math's not math. So in order for me to make myself comfortable with sin, I got to create a lie that allows me to do it. Because we are created to worship. We are created with a natural morality to understand and know who God is. That he exists. That he's real. We all have it in us. It tells us that in Romans. So for my mind... Right? Because my mind was created with that instilled. That we are, we are creatures meant to praise and worship. Well, I got to say God's not real so I could worship this false God. Right? We know that we shouldn't be doing certain things. That's why even in things that society has welcomed, people still feel bad about it. That's your innate morality that has been created in us. So what I got to do? I got to lie to myself. I was born this way. Right, that the scripture is outdated. It's not. It's not compatible with today's culture, with today's society. Because my mind is like that math, not math. <laughs> so I got to deal with that gut, that feeling in my gut that this is wrong, that this is making me feel bad, that I'm feeling ashamed of this, that that conviction is starting to take hold. I got a lot of myself. So what this scripture is telling us: Don't you even open your mouth to say that God puts you in this situation. God will not tempt you. He cannot. Because there is no evil in him. There is no darkness in him. So, in confessing our sin, we got to start with this premise. And and really what we're going to see as we build this up, this this honesty is really to counter self-denial. Lord, I was tempted because I wanted to do it. Now we can get somewhere. 
Now we can have an honest conversation. Now we can deal with the root cause of this temptation, of this desire, so the Lord can build us up through the power of the Holy Spirit to change our taste to change our habits in the things that we desire. But until we start with telling them the truth, the Lord is just like, I can't help you. Yeah. Alright, so. Take that bag down. Bag down. She keep trying to go in the bag. Let's go to, um, we're going to stay in the New King James Version. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. So Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He, <clears throat> he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So this is where we're talking about the prescribed way. Jesus is making it clear. You trying to hide this is not going to lead to prosperity. <laughs> like, it ain't going to work out. It's not going to be good for you. All it's going to do is keep you bound to this iniquity. But the person that confesses and forsakes, they will receive mercy. Because that's the prescribed way. They opened their mouth. Lord, I made a mistake. I messed up. I don't want to live this lifestyle no more. I don't want to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. I'm ready to be honest with myself and with you. Now we can go somewhere. Now we can get somewhere. But it goes to the, the, this aspect we're talking about. We were talking about before it overtakes you. That's what covering the sin. You're not going to prosper. You're not going to grow. It is going to literally keep you bound Lord have mercy can you move her cause she looking for edge and everything <laughs> so covering your sin only leads to your own destruction. That's you will not prosper. And confessing is the only path for you to actually set up to be able to move past that sin and move past those mistakes. Uh, okay, so we're staying in the New Key James Version. Now we're going to go to Psalm 69, verse 5. So Psalm 69, verse 5. Oh God, you know my foolishness <laughs> and my sins are not hidden from you. He already knows. You can't hide it. You can't trick him. You can't deceive. You, he knows your foolishness. And so this is why when we're talking about just confess, the Lord is like, I've already, I already know. And, and this is what makes it worse. You know I know. <laughs> Truthfully, you don't try to hide something that you think people don't know. Right. Because what's the point of hiding it? <laughs> I'm hiding it because I'm hoping, well, maybe they missed it this time. Well, let me just, let me do some extra preparation to make sure that they don't discover it. Right? The threat of discovery is what makes a person hide something. That's why, for example, corporations, memos, emails, all that stuff is documented. But the moment a crime is broke, happen, an investigation come down, the indictment come down, all of a sudden the memo, emails that disappear. What happened to the memos? <laughs> the threat of discovery. Yeah. We know we broke the law. We know we did. Let's destroy the evidence. And so with this psalm, God, you know my foolishness. You already know. So let me start with confession. Yeah. And that is, honestly, that is the, the security and the safety that we have in God is that we can confess our sins and get them right. Because Old Testament, I don't know how they made it. <laughs> yes, they had sacrifice to cover, but there was no process to remove. 
And, they, and they, there was no, they had an in-between. The high priest, there was no direct relationship between them and the Lord when it came to sin and forgiveness. And after they sacrificed, they then had to go, all right, step one, step two, step three. I got to follow the checklist, what I'm not supposed to be doing, what I am doing. No, we have the benefit of this very simple request line. Lord, I done messed up. So being honest with ourselves is knowing this so we can just confess first. So as we're building disciples, this is what we want to train them on. You're not going to get one over the Lord, over on the Lord. He already knows. He was there when you did it. <laughs> so, you messed up, confess. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to cover it. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that, no, confess. Move. You messed up, confess. And move past it. And in having an honest relationship with the Lord, that's, that is communication. That is effective communication. Because we have this path, use it. And that's what godly intimacy is about and what we're, we're going to continue to keep building on is the relationship is actually the tool that connects us to the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the intimacy, without that bridge, without that connector, you, you, you will not be effective in operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. You might, you know... A blind squirrel finds a, finds a nut every now and again. You might trip into it. <laughs> it might happen by accident. You might see it every now and again. But when we're talking about consistent effectiveness, you got to be. You have to have that build of intimacy strong. And part of that is when you find yourself in fault, when you find yourself in sin, don't waste time. Confess, I messed up. And what we're talking about with the relationship with the Lord is. He is just to forgive and will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You ain't never got to worry about admitting and owning a mistake with the Lord that is going to come up again. That is going to be thrown in your face. That is going to be held against you. That you're going to be constantly reminded of it and badgered. Nope. Slate's clean. Let's hit that reset. Let's start over again. All right, so last verse. Let's stay in the New King James Version. And let's go to Psalm 32, verse 5. So... The 32nd Psalm, verse 5 in the New King James Version. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And what happened? And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's what we're talking about here in honesty. You see how simple that was? How direct? There was no, no guessing. No, is he really a man of his word? Is he really going to forgive my sin? Yes. This is exactly what he wants. Jesus desired that all men would, would come to repentance. And so now, us being born again and being disciples and having access to this forgiveness, we have to to use it. And we have to train disciples. Don't get weighted down and entrenched in iniquity. When you mess up, acknowledge it. Why? Because you're not, you can't hide it. He already knows. He already saw. And at the end of the day, if you truly want to have a relationship with the Lord, this is a breach in that relationship. You cannot be in right standing with the Lord and in sin. Those things cannot be together. They are separate. They are contrary. They are on opposite ends of the, the spectrum. You only get to choose one. And so if, you're, if you have set your mind that, Lord, I want to be for you. Lord, I want to be a tool that can be used by you. I want to be an effective disciple. Confession of sin needs to be in your daily communication. And that is what's being honest with yourself and being honest with the Lord. You start off with, whenever you mess up, just acknowledge it. And going back to my father, I can honestly say in the times when I did mess up and went straight to him, it actually ended up working better for me than the other times when I tried to hide from him, when I tried to deceive people, trying to get it fixed by myself. Because now I had the benefit 
of my father's life experience, his authority as my parent and guardian, and the grace that came with being his son. I know you're going to make mistakes. Like that's, and that was the hardest thing with my parents is I understand it now being an adult, but as a child, right, it's like if I expected you as a child to be perfect, <laughs> you would not need a parent. <laughs> like, why would you need me? When we had you, we know you're going to make mistakes, you're going to do stupid stuff. As you grew and matured, that there were going to be things that decisions you made that we were going to be disappointed in that we wish you would not have done but we established this relationship and this trust and this vulnerability that when those situations arose you could feel comfortable enough to just come and go I need help I need help and that is what confession of sin is for us is to come to the Lord and just be able to say Lord I messed up and I need your help and he is perfect and he is just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But the confession of sin starts with us. And I think, you know, when we're when we're doing the altar calls, when we're having the conversations, right, we make it, we make it this outpour and this outreach from God's perspective of come to me, right? Which he wants you to. But you coming to him means you gotta take the first step. <laughs> you gotta open your mouth. And that is what confession of sin is to acknowledge to unhide and to confess so the Lord can forgive. Thoughts, questions, comments before we move on to uh, the next one. Okay, so as we're talking about honesty, right? So we're talking about confession of sin and necessary, but humility is as well because a prideful person ain't going to admit to nothing. <laughs> so let's start, and we're going to stay in the New King James Version. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses uh, 6 and 7. So, in the New King James Version, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Humility is, ne- is a necessity in honesty. If I am proud, if I am haughty, if I am arrogant, I ain't going to be honest with nobody. And so what the scripture is telling us is understand that God is more powerful than you. <laughs> that he is mighty. Humble yourself under that authority under that power, under that that sovereignty, humble yourself under it because it is going to be better for you. That humility is going to lead you to cast your care upon him. That humility that humility is going to lead to you accepting his help. Accepting his role in your life. Confessing your sins and getting it right. Acknowledging the fact that you're weak, that you need help, that you have carnal desires, that you need him to develop out of you. Humility is so needed in honesty. And a lot of times when we see it in relationships between two people, both are prideful. And that pride actually becomes a feedback loop. Because, well, Tremiko's not honest with me, so why should I be honest with her right well Tremiko seemed like she got it all together well I'm not about to tell her that I need help and then she looking at me and like well Donovan seemed like he got together so I'm not about to open my cards right it's like you're playing really chicken yeah I got my cards Tremiko got her cards and the only way for this relationship to work is if we both put them on the table and play hands up but neither one of us wants to be the first neither one of us wants to be the chicken But that relationship with the Lord is not like that because he's already been like this. (laughs) He's already been hands down from junk. This is it. This is what I've told you. Everything about me, I've told you everything as it pertains to our relationship. Shoot, I even told you, don't call me back until you've thought about it. (laughs) Everything that I've communicated to you. Everything that comes to this relationship. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, you gotta go back to mommy, buddy. Mm. So, without humbling ourselves, we're going to make it extremely difficult for the Lord to operate in our life. Because as Tremiko said a few weeks ago, the way God fights our battles, the way he operates in our lives, is we evoke him. We say, we need you. I need your help. I'm utilized, I'm pulling the receipts of what your scriptures say, your promises. I'm evoking your word into my life. That is that it's that comes from humility. I am at a crossroads. I am in a situation in every situation, Lord, that I need you to move on my behalf. I need you to give me direction. I need understanding. I need power. I need authority. I cannot do it without you. That is rooted in humility. And if you do not have it in your relationship, you're not going to be honest with the Lord. And you're going to continue to put yourself in adversarial situations where you're getting your butt beat. And I've seen it. I've seen it so many times where you can sometimes like see the stress on a person. Like you would get, like you through. Like I know you're struggling. And you ask, is there anything that I can help you with? No, I'm good. That's not what the vein on the side of your head said. Right? So for example, one day I was, um, I was at the grocery store. And I saw this woman was care. You know, I mean, we all do it, right? Where you like, I'm gonna grab every bag because I'm just trying to make one trip, right? She was struggling. Usually, I just mind my business. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be nice. I clear. I clearly see that you cannot do this. I was like, man, you. I was like, you need me help. I, I don't mind helping you. And she got an attitude. Does it look like I need help? Yes. It really. Yes. Is. Yes. <laughs> That's why I asked. Breathing all hard. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking like, you're prideful. Because that's what pride does. You think it's it's something to be embarrassed of or shameful to be like, yeah, actually, could you take these few bags? Because I'm like, lady, I'm not saying that you're inadequate. Like, there is nothing about you that I'm saying that you are inferior because you need help. Yeah. We all do. And so when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, that's what God is saying. You can't do this without me. It doesn't make you less than. It makes you human. So without that humility, we're going to be like that lady at the grocery store who I then left her to her own devices to haul them bags to her car. Because <laughs> I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to ask more than once. <laughs> Especially you got me going out my own way. You going to get an attitude with me? Fine then. Go about yourself. But that's what God is saying. He sees us with the weight of the world on our shoulders. The weight of our sin. The weight of our mistakes. The weight of our thoughts and our doubts and our fears and our anxieties and our inadequacies that are highlighted every time we talk to a person. And he's just like, I can make all that go away. If you would just ask me for help through, through my, our relationship and the power of my spirit. I can get you to develop, to build your character, to dine on my word, to develop the competencies to be able to deal with this. But all it literally, it starts with you being humble enough to say, God, I need your help. All right, so let's go to, so we're going to stay in the New King James Version. Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 10. So in the New King James Version, James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So, one of the things that I find interesting, right, is when you look at not everyone, but a lot of folks who are in positions of influence or authority, they come off as very prideful, arrogant, cocky individuals. And we are attracted to those types of personalities. Um, like they've literally done a study on it when it came to like type A, type B personalities. Like the, the propensity for a person to get promoted. They usually have type A personalities traits. They, they're very boisterous. They're very uh, confrontational. They, 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 they speak um, more frequently. They're not afraid to say what there's on, they're on their mind. Whereas a person with a type B personality, they're more reserved. Not necessarily that they, they don't like to speak. They're just more reserved, right? They're not as sociable. They kind of like to think things through, pace themselves. But when you go into environments 
type A personalities are one, typically the ones that lend to positions of leadership because they feel like, well, th this person is showing me everything that I want a leader to be. But when it comes to the Lord, he's like, that's not what I want. <laughs> I want the opposite. I want a person who will humble themselves and say, I don't have all the answers. I don't need to hear the sound of my own voice. I don't mind saying I don't know everything. I don't mind saying, you know what, we, we probably need to approach this as a team. Let's be collaborative. I want to hear everybody else's voice. They humble themselves in his sight. Then you are exalted. Then you will be lifted up. And so when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, that's the mindset we have to have. We have sometimes these grandiose ideas and visions of what we want to accomplish. But you don't have the humility to get there. Right? So even when we're just talking spiritual, I want to be the greatest disciple that ever walked the earth. But what is your spirit? Do you have a humble spirit? Because I'm going to tell you right now, to be even a decent disciple, <laughs> to be average requires a great degree of humility because you are going to be disrespected you're going to be mistreated it is going to be a life of 98% of rejection right so anything with the Lord comes from the mindset of humble yourself show me that you are willing to say, Lord, I don't have all the answers. Lord, I need your help. I need your power. I need your authority. Then you will be lifted up. You will be exalted in positions of influence, of power, whatever it is that you want, in whatever aspect of life. And so when we're, when we're building up saints into disciples, this, what, this is kind of points back to when we're talking about being honest with yourself about your gaps, about your flaws, about your weaknesses. The strength to overcome those comes from your humility to admit that you can't do it by yourself. And when you do that, the Lord then can exalt you and lift you up because you can work with a humble person. Mm -hmm. You can teach a humble person. You can develop a humble person. But someone who is prideful, someone who is haughty, they don't think they need those things. I got all the answers. I don't need your help. I don't need you to teach me. Which, I'm better than you. I got more natural talent than you. I'm a better speaker than you. Okay. And, and what we know about scripture, what it shows us is you can humble yourself willingly or you can be humbled. <laughs> you decide which path you want to go down. So, as we continue to talk about this, we'll pick up next week. Um, continue with talking about humility is necessary. And then we're going to even see greater reasons why, because we're going to see in scripture that we are weak as human beings. And scripture is very clear in that and that we need to learn that there are things that we need to understand. And all of this points back to godly intimacy, that to be able to maximize the effects of our relationship with them, to become effective disciples, uh, we need humility to admit the things that we do not know uh, so that he can give us greater knowledge, understanding, wisdom and revelation. All right, any last minute thoughts, questions, or comments? Okay. All right, Lord, we just thank you for this lesson, oh Lord. We just thank you um, for the ear to receive, oh God, your word that we would all continue uh, to grow, to become uh, effective disciples, oh God, to lean not to our understanding, but your own, um, and to acknowledge you in our life in every aspect, oh God, and that uh, you will reveal to us in the areas where we need to improve, oh Lord, and that we would have the humility to accept that correction and, and course correct. Lord, I just pray right now that everyone who leaves, those who are traveling, <laughs> that they would get there safely, oh God, and that everyone would enjoy the rest of their weekend and give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay.